Hello and welcome back to another action-packed, tree-planting, beer-swilling, cigarette-eating, charity-giving, treasure-finding, orphan-saving episode of My Philosophy Book. Where did it come from? Well, I actually stole it from someone. But the person I stole it from stole it from someone else. So I was only stealing from a thief anyway. So it's okay, right? I mean, morally speaking, I think it cancels it out. Or does it? I don't know. Now that we're talking about morals, what is morality anyway? This idea of what's right and wrong, where does it come from? And these questions of right and wrong are the kind that keep you up at night. For example, questions about morality, which are relevant today. Things like abortion, execution, animal rights. These are big questions, so naturally you would assume they need big answers. But funnily enough... It doesn't work out that way in real life. When it comes to a lot of these big questions and these big issues, many people, and myself included in this, make a decision on these things quite easily, actually. There's not a lot of soul-searching that goes into these questions that maybe there ought to be. And not only do we come to these conclusions quite easily on these matters, but usually instantaneously. So, for example, let's say something that is widely debated in the world today is abortion. And when you really think about it, no matter which side of the argument you fall on, whether you're for or against, there are going to be arguments that support you and arguments that go against you. And there are so many different angles to look at. There's so many ways you can spin the information. And with all these different facts and statistics, I think it's fair to say that this is a complicated issue. But how many of you listening now can say that when you first heard this issue of abortion, and I know abortion is by no means new, but there was a point at which you didn't know it, and then you did. So whenever that was, whenever someone told you about it, or you heard it in the news, or you found out by some other means, when you first heard of abortion, did you think Hold on, I'm not going to make my mind up about this yet. This seems like it's going to be a big issue. I'm going to go away. I'm going to get all the relevant information, all the uh, important readings from both sides. I'm going to take that all in, study it. And then, only after I've done that, I'm going to come to an informed, unbiased conclusion. I don't think many people, and again, myself included, can say that we've done that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe it's something we should be mindful of in the future. But it's natural. Even the most open-minded people are still human, after all. We are programmed to make quick decisions. It's built into us as a survival mechanism. It's in our nature to divide and identify things. We like to categorize them as one of two options. For some reason, we love twos. You're either with us or against us. It's on or it's off. It's in or it's out. We don't like grey areas for some reason. We like taking two things, two opposing things, and that is the criteria. So we have friend or foe, fight or flight, good or bad. So, bringing it back to this issue of abortion, we are faced with an unfamiliar situation. Someone has just told you about this thing. And you don't know what it is. So you have to make a snap decision. Because it's in your nature. And you base that decision off pre-existing moral code that's in you. And your opinion may change later on. As sometimes it often does when you get more information. Because we're not a slave to this pre-existing condition. But there will be a base judgment that will serve as the foundation for understanding this situation. You have to feel something about it before you can learn about it. You have to identify it. It's just in our nature. So when it comes to a topic like abortion, it's natural to have a gut reaction. And you think, I support that or I'm against that. And that will be based on your pre-existing moral code. But we're not here to figure out, is it right to be like this or is it wrong to be like this? Or any of the answers to these topics. The question is, where do morals come from? And I don't mean 
nature versus nurture or someone's individual beliefs. I mean, generally speaking, where does this idea of what is right and what is wrong come from? Because in every society in the world, no matter where they have originated from, no matter what part of the world, some principal rules seem to overlap. They seem to be the same. Even the fact that all our cultures seem to have a guiding set of principles, no matter where they come from. And these will usually cover things like don't kill, don't steal, be honest. Things like loyalty and bravery, traits that we associate with being good and moral. And we may not all possess these traits. We may not all be brave and loyal and honest all of the time. And some people actively ignore them or avoid these traits. But I think it's fair to say that most people can recognise these traits as good or moral traits. And then the opposite of these, being things like murder, theft, dishonesty and cruelty are immoral. And I think most people can recognise that as well. So what I'm asking is where do we get this understanding of moral traits from? How do we know what is good and how do we know what is bad? Now, last week, if you remember, we touched on this slightly uh, when we were going over relativity. We heard Alfred North Whiteman ask, what is morality in any given time or place? And he said, it is what the majority then and there happen to like. And immorality is what they dislike. Now, I think that is true to a certain extent. But it's a bit cynical. And there are another group of people who have a different theory when it comes to where we get our ideas of what is good and what is bad. So that brings me to what we're really talking about today, and that is the theory of divine command. The theory is basically that something is good because God says it is, and something is bad because God says it is. So he will tell us what is good and what is bad, and that's the final word of it. Now, maybe you're not the most religious person in the world. Maybe you believe in something, some higher power, but you're not sure what. Or maybe you're just an atheist. Maybe you don't believe in anything. But no matter what you believe in, I don't think anyone can deny the effect religion has had on the development of our world's moral beliefs. Whether it's the Ten Commandments or the Five Pillars of Islam, almost every major religion has a creed or text that instructs its followers the correct way to behave. And the justification for behaving like this, for following this code, is that God said so. And for most people, this was enough for many, many years. And for people today who still believe it is enough, and if you were a devoted follower of a particular religion, why would you question it? And this is a quick tangent, but I find it interesting how often I'm finding myself while recording these uh, episodes describing a situation and a way of being, and then asking, why would you question it? Because I think that's a mentality a lot of us have, is why would you question it when it comes to a lot of things? But when you do question the accepted truth, things definitely seem to get a bit more interesting. But that's the end of that tangent. We'll get back to this. So, to sum up, the divine command. It's God's place to command, and it's the human's place to obey. If you follow the rules, you're a good person. Break the rules, and you're a sinner. Simple enough. And the appealing part of this argument is that if these rules are coming straight from the big man himself, it puts people at ease, it relaxes them. It's a weight off your mind that you can accept that morality is a fixed concept. It won't change. The way you behave today will always be good. You don't have to worry about it. And it also puts to bed another worrying theory that morality is just something that humans make up as they go along, and people don't like that. So to know that morality is and always will be the same is comforting for some people so that all sounds pretty nice you know all wrapped up in a nice neat little bow but let me tell you a story of a man who was not convinced now regular listeners might be able to guess who this person is but i will reveal his name at the end so there is a man and his friend euthyphro and this man and euthyphro are discussing piety meaning discussing what it is to be religious or, or to be good at being religious. That's piety, being religious or reverent. So the man asks Euthyphro about this and they toss it around for a bit and eventually they come to an agreement that piety is whatever is loved by the gods. 
because this was back then, they were working off many gods, but you can apply it to one single god if you like. So, piety is, or you could simplify that to, goodness is whatever is loved by the gods. That makes sense, all seems well and good, but then our man asks Euthyphro, are pious things pious because they are loved by the gods, or do the gods love them because they are pious? Now take a minute to let that sink in. Now, maybe that seems like splitting hairs, but think about it. Swap out the word piety or pious for charity. Something we can roughly agree is always good. We'll say charity is goodness. So, is something like charity good because God says it is? Or is charity good in of itself and God is just recognizing this and letting us know that it's good? Now, this may seem like a simple question, but it really puts a thorn in the side of the divine command theorist. And we'll get back to exactly why it does that in just a little bit. And that was the Euthyphro dilemma. So, did you guess who it was that brought up this question? That's right. It was your boy Plato, back again to squash the dreams of yet another philosopher in this series. It seems like that's all he does, is go around ruining the other ideas uh, philosophers had. But, to be fair to Plato, this idea of divine command had some of its own flaws to begin with before he even posed this question of uh, the Euthyphro dilemma. One big one being that these religions have sacred texts, like the Bible, the Quran, the Torah. These texts are the number one piece of evidence that we as human beings use to understand the will of their respective gods. So we read the Bible and we are told that this is the word of the Lord. This is God's word in written form. It's the closest thing we have to knowing exactly what he wants. But the problem is these texts are filled with contradictions. One being in the Bible, a famous one, is that the book of Leviticus 20.13 says, if a man lies with another male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. That's not great. But if the Bible is the word of God, and God's word determines what is right and wrong, based on this it is perfectly okay to commit murder, to murder practicing male homosexuals. Now, most people today will agree that to do something like that is barbaric and immoral. Unfortunately, that one line has been used to justify committing atrocities both in the past and present. But here is the contradiction. Conveniently, what some people forget is there is another word of God in the form of the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. Now, that word of God is in direct opposition to the previous word of God. So which one do we take? as rule. I'm sure you've heard as well, people say the Bible says an eye for an eye. But was it not Jesus himself who said in Matthew 5.39, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. So that's another example of two contrasting accounts of what is God's word. And if we are to take God's word as the definition for what is good and what is bad, the problem is, which do we listen to? And this is a problem when trying to base a moral code using accounts written from other people spanning years and years, with each entry giving different ideas of what God's will is. And this is one of the many reasons why philosophers rejected the idea of divine command. Another such problem faced by the divine theorists is the growing number of people who aren't even convinced that God exists. Because if you don't have your divine law maker, the whole idea falls apart in of itself. God is the central part to their theory. But the followers of the divine theory say that this question of morality itself is proof that God exists. So they say that number one, morality exists, ethics exist, and we question them. We can agree on this, we say yeah, so they say okay, well then that brings us to number two. God is the only one who could have come up with these commands and laws, these morals and ethics. He's the only one suitable to be that lawmaker. And so they go on to say, number three, ergo, God must exist. Now, 
I don't know how you feel about that argument, but I think it's less than convincing. And so did many other philosophers. Some had a few problems with it as well. One being that the idea suggests that things like morality and ethics exist separate or independently to humans. That it is somehow its own thing that we don't have within ourselves. But that's not the whole story. As I said before, I was going to go into a bit more detail about why the Eutifro dilemma challenges the theory of divine command. So, quickly recap in case you forget, because I know we talked about it a few minutes ago. Is what is good, good, because God commands it? Or does God command it because it's good? Now, long story short, neither option is good for the divine command theorists. Why? Well, let's look at it part by part. So, option number one. It's good because God said it is. Okay, what's the problem with that? The problem is what if instead of God saying killing is bad, he decides to say it was good? That killing, for whatever reason, was okay. Then, it would be good because God said so. And followers would be obliged to follow this command, despite the fact that they may feel differently. So that's not great, but is option two any better? Well, not really. So if God commands it is good, because it's good anyway, it's just being good all by itself, then clearly goodness exists independently of God. So God is passing on the knowledge and the information of what's good without actually having done anything himself. He has nothing to do with it. Essentially, what that means is we could go straight to the source of goodness, say, we could find it for ourselves and cut out the middleman. And this leaves the divine theorist in a pinch. They don't want to admit that God could change morality on a whim, and they don't want to reduce God to the status of an unneeded messenger. So the divine command theorists come back with a counter-argument, and that is, God is good. Remember that, God is good. And he wouldn't command evil, even if the older boys were watching and they said he wouldn't be cool if he didn't. God won't do it. The problem with this argument is that it can become incoherent quite quickly. So, basing our reason off what the divine theory tells us, good is something commanded by God. Now, if God is good, that means, essentially, God is something that follows the commands of God. It doesn't make sense. And I know that's looking at it literally. You're probably saying that's very literal. You're just taking the words and taking them too literally, I'm sure what they meant is that God is, is equal to goodness, he's identical to goodness, so therefore his commands will be good. But we are then trapped again in this same circle of not really knowing what God is, because if God is like goodness, and what is goodness? Goodness is what is commanded by God, and God is like goodness, which is like godness. We still don't know what good or goodness is. And we have a vague idea of what this God guy is. He's someone who just tells himself what to do and does it really well. And the divine command theory soon finds itself quickly wrapped up in its own arguments. So, what was the point of all this? What should you take from this? I think it's important to be mindful of where your idea of morality comes from. It's comforting to accept a pre existing idea of good and bad but it's a slippery slope to blind obedience. It's harder to decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong, but if we take a leaf from the Euthyphro dilemma, it seems to tell us either God can't be trusted to make these laws himself, or goodness is an independent concept that's out there already waiting for you to find it. Anyway, that's the divine command theory and the Euthyphro dilemma in a nutshell. If you're interested, you could listen to last week's podcast where we touch on morality a little bit when we talk about relativism. And sure, while you're there, why not have a look at the other podcasts because a lot of the stuff we talk about in this one overlaps with the other ones and they all seem to overlap together. So you're really doing yourself a favour by listening to all the podcasts. And uh, hey, look, if you like them, why not subscribe? That way you can stay notified about when the latest podcasts are coming out. Anyway, this has been my philosophy book. Thanks for listening.